Welcome to the Oh Hell No podcast, where Kay Nicole delivers a daily dose of inspiration by discussing passion, purpose, and struggle with people who are living their best life doing what they love. Here's Nicole. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Oh Hell No podcast. Today I have Lisa Phillips. She is an entrepreneur, a real estate investor, an author, a speaker. She is the founder of Affordable Real Estate Investments. And tonight we are going to find out about her business and real estate and all that good stuff. So welcome to the podcast, Lisa. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me and thank you to everyone who's listening tonight. I hope you get a lot of value out of this. Yes, I'm sure they will. So how did you find your way into real estate? Uh, A humbling experience, uh, a foreclosure during 2009. I bought in Las Vegas right out of college, um, a very overpriced and overinflated house uh, in 2006 at the very top of the market. And within a few months of buying it, like the market started crashing and it crashed hard in Vegas. And um, I had left Las Vegas at that time and I went, wound up in Ohio. And within a couple of years, I had gotten laid off again. And the house that I had purchased in Vegas had dropped to half its value by that time. So this is like 2006 to 2009. And me, with my engineering degree, couldn't get a job, right? You know, coming out of college, you couldn't have told me anything. I'm like, I'm smart. I'm capable. But, you know, humbling experiences will do it to you, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm out of work again, and I'm sending out hundreds of applications, no job, and I had to let that house go. And the only thing that saved it is because I had been gone for, you know, three years. I just bought a really inexpensive $35,000 condo right before everything happened and I lost the job and I had to let the other house go. So it was like, try to pay for this overinflated house that's worth half its value that would take 20 years to regain or let it go and just focus on what I do have, which was a low cost property, cost $35,000. It was in a really nice part of town because I discovered when I left Las Vegas that outside of like New York and DC, things are quite affordable. Like not every city has sky high prices there are some reasonably priced houses around this country and it's a very big country and i was like well this is comfortable i have a mortgage note of 350 bucks i'm going to have a foreclosure but in my mind i said you know what i'll just wait the seven years by that time i'll be 35 i'll be good you know you know what i mean right and i was like during the meantime i was like i'll just find more thirty thousand dollar houses and well you know what I mean so it was just it was like it was falling down being in that position um having some level of security in a low price modest 800 square foot condo and going well you know I can wait seven years while this happens but in the meantime let me learn how to fix this place up let me spend my time working on these skills and crafts wow So my next question was going to be, in terms of past work experience, what do you think prepared you for where you are today professionally? But it seems like you just kind of jumped right into this out of college. Well, you know, there's two parts. Me getting into real estate investing, I will say a lot of it is my engineering background. Okay. Because when I tackled this, I was new. You have the internet, but for real estate investing, that isn't always worth anything, (laughs) right? Because the scenario you're in is different than what you're reading online. But, you know, I just developed a lot of systems and I tackled it by sort of going back to what I learned in my training as an engineer, which is take everything that's complex and break it into its individual components. So instead of getting flustered, I would just take things step by step and break it down to what I could understand and then just sort of build on it. So I would say uh, work-wise, I did learn some skills. Like um, I jumped in the job that I had that I got laid off from. I was IT. I was technical sales. Mm -hmm. So there is some level of refinement and learning how to work with people in the sales atmosphere that always helps in um, building a business regardless of its real estate or something else, just learning how to talk to people, how to ask questions of your contractors does play a role. And the engineering did play a role, but I wasn't anything like a real estate agent or anything like that. 
in that way. So it's sort of like the skills you build in other areas can always be applied to business. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I always try to draw a correlation between something that you've done in the past that you have no idea what you're Mm going to be doing in the future. But somehow when you think back on it, you're like, wow, thank God I learned that because it's helping me now. And, you know, you can kind of go back and connect the dots. (laughs) So I I went from wow to like, I was supposed to do this my whole life. This was my purpose. Right. I, yeah, I, I take it to that that one step further to the purpose. I was supposed to do all this. Um, for instance, uh, the $35,000 property. So I started building a system and getting consistency with doing this. And uh, a lot of the homes that I now invest in and encourage other people to invest in are low-income and working-class homes. Well, that's where I grew up. I know those type of neighborhoods. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's what I know. And it's also a skill set in this investing genre because you can get the lowest price, but also be very successful in it. So that's like another thing of like, oh, wow. So me being born in that position is actually a beautiful strength to be able to navigate different demographics as I invest in these neighborhoods that are, do you know what I mean? So absolutely. So People think getting into real estate is easy, right? Mm -hmm. Tell me what is the easiest part of getting Mm. about getting into real estate investing and the challenges of getting into real estate investing. Well, uh, people think it's easy. Yeah, Uh, I always hear people saying, oh, you should just get an investment property. Oh, you should just flip houses. Oh, you like, like there's nothing to it. And I'm like, what? (laughs) No, well, I mean, if it inspires you, I'm okay with that. But wow, to ask me what's been easy about it. There is. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. (laughs) Oh, those people are. (laughs) Okay. Um. Okay, here's something that's easy, and it's more of mindset. What's easy about it is to want what real estate can give you. So what's easy is like the dream. What's easy is like the motivation and what it can kickstart in you, the drive to have, say, passive income or to build wealth with real estate and a tangible investment. I think real estate investing is that one thing that people get stars in their eyes. Yeah, You know, I think they can get really, really, truly excited. Everybody understands having a home, the need for a home, and being profitable from a home. And that it can be big, highly profitable, right? Like big profits, not necessarily little profits. Mm -hmm. So I think the easy part sometimes is really getting caught up in the energy and desire, which is important because that's what gets you through anything that's rough. Okay. So that's the, that's the easy part. <laughs> I don't know what those other people were talking about. So. <laughs> now, I will say, I have been doing this for six years. I've been helping people all over the country for six years. When people work with me, it's easy because they can simply ask me, Lisa, uh, I see these two houses, or I have this much money in my 401k, and I have money here. Which one should I use? It's easy for them when they work with someone who's experienced because I can answer those questions. But pretty much if you don't have either deep pockets to be able to make mistakes or someone you can ask those questions off who know the industry really well and who is accessible to you, uh, I think in those cases it can be easy. But outside of that, you're really learning on your own if you don't have some of those resources. Mm, And those sound like challenges. (laughs) access to people (laughs) access to people deep pockets being able to yet like all of those things sound like the challenges of you know getting into real estate if you don't have those things you know in place it can be a challenging experience yeah no exactly so that's why I really um, you know I'm pretty clear about the demographic I work with um, like the type of neighborhoods I work with and that's just because I go to the lower income neighborhoods because they're affordable. They're 30000 40000 50000 And people like me can actually afford it. So I'm usually really clear about what I'm doing, what price range I'm working at, that they're mostly minority neighborhoods. I'm cool. I'm a minority. I'm okay. Most of the people I work with are minorities. They're okay. And even if they're not, for the most part, they do understand, like, they came up with modest beginnings and now, you know, they navigate it through um, education or through really good jobs to a place where they have money to invest. But yeah, so, you know, so that's why I always like to say this strategy is for people 
is for like the 99%, the people who don't have rich relatives, right? Mm -hmm. But there are literally a lot of investors out there who are giving advice and their advice comes from that place of affluence, wealth, privilege. And if they had a a father who can give them an $80,000 loan. Now, my dad has money because he saves and he's really, really frugal, right? Mm-hmm. I don't think I can get a buck out of him, right? <laughs> just not, he doesn't have that mindset. But other people and other cultures do, right? They right. save up to give their kids opportunities like that. And so I always like to be really clear that, you know, there are haves and haves not. So my strategy is really for those who, you know, we're making it, but we don't have deep pockets, but that's nothing to be ashamed of. Okay, great. I love that. So can you tell us what was your best deal and what was your worst deal? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you really got to get vulnerable for a second. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Best deal was um, the second rental property I purchased in Baltimore for $13,500. I knew I saw it online and I... I sort of like looked at the metrics that I had discovered at that point. I was like, yeah, this is just sitting there. This is fine. I went and bought it. I put about $20,000 into it. Some of it line of credit, some of it cash out of my 401k. And uh, I paid it off within four years. It was all paid off, all the debt that was associated with it. And for that entire time, it cash flowed. Um, until I paid it off, it, you know, it cash flowed about like, you know, 400 bucks a month. But within three or four years, it was like, you know, I was just getting $910 a month in my bank account, right? And, you know, three years passes like a snap of the fingers, right? So it was just so, and I had it for about eight years. And it was so profitable the whole time. Wow. So I was just like, oh, I love real estate, right? <laughs> I love this. I got to do more. So that was the best deal. That one's easier. The worst deal. Oh, this one was a little ugly. So I bought a vacant property across from uh, a development in Baltimore. I'll preface this by saying Baltimore is a fun city to visit. It can be a very corrupt city, though, with the city government. They can be very uncaring if you get in their way. Okay? Very uncaring. They do not care. Mm. And they have an attitude with it, too. You know, so I'd purchased this vacant property and there are vacant properties all over Baltimore. But this one I purchased, it was right across from a um, a school, a $40 million charter school that was being built through um, nonprofit organizations. And uh, they're very shady. They sent me like, hey, this is a vacant. So because it's vacant, it's automatically a nuisance. Right. So they're just like you have 30 days to remediate this or else you have to go to court and we're taking it. And I remember calling them and I was like, hey, I got your letter. Is there anything I need to do? 30 days is impossible in Baltimore, as you know. It's just like that's impossible to renovate a full house in 30 days, right? Do you know what I mean? Like even not even regardless if it's Baltimore or not, that's just not easy to do. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, is this for real? (laughs) I almost didn't believe it. I was like, is this for real? And they're like, yeah, I was like, okay, well, you let me know um, what the next steps are. These are my addresses. Um, And I gave her an updated address. And um, they didn't use the updated address I gave them except one more time. Then after that, they sent all the correspondences to an old address. They're like, we don't have to use your new address. We can use the old address that's on file. So Mm -hmm. it's completely shady and corrupt. And what happened is, like, they took all the houses on that one block. Mind you, there's hundreds of vacants, but this one's right next to a revitalization zone. And they didn't say anything. They didn't mark it on the permit. So when I started fixing it up, there was no indicator when we pulled permits that, you know, they were trying, they had taken it through their eminent domain. And so I found out during the middle of a renovation and someone walked off the street and I think it was like the heaven sent them just so I would stop and not spend any more money. Oh. And uh, they're like, this is our property. I was like, your property. And they get, had given all of these properties on this one strip to a nonprofit that was working hand in hand with code enforcement and neighborhood enforcement. So basically it went straight from us into this one nonprofit hand who then sold the house that I bought for 10000 Fixed it up and sold it for 220000 right? Oh, my God. Oh, it was shady. Uh, it was greasy. I was like, ugh, y'all do things like this? So did and you get anything for it when they took they it? They were like, you? oh, well, when we sold it to the non $2,000. Oh, no, hon. That oh, is it was an shady. oh, hell it was shady. no. 
I, and so I talk about it on my video, my YouTube channel, which was good because what I found out is that when I posted, a lot of people started saying, oh my gosh, you know what? I have a neighborhood and all of a sudden it's gentrifying. I'm getting all these code enforcement violations. And I got information like that from all over the country. And the, the government preys on in black communities on taking, but trying to through eminent domain in different ways using code enforcement or neighborhood enforcement as the arm of it mm -hmm. to try to force the issue. So I was so um, spiritually, because, you know, uh, all of this is purpose driven, me doing this, this platform and what I'm doing now. Uh, I remember meditating and, and asking the question, why would why did that happen? And, you know, the answer I got back was, you know, it was supposed to happen. This was yeah, this was part of this was better this way because it was protect, you know, it's better for your energy to have not gone through what you would have went through trying to keep it. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter. You're going to do better, way better than ever before. And I have, you know, we're way surpassed that. So that was the worst deal. And, um, you know, it was very interesting seeing. I, I then sold the other property I had in Baltimore because I'm not into spending money or investing money where my money's not appreciated in my eyes. And also because Baltimore is such a can be a headache for an investor. They're very tenant friendly, which I get, but they take it to a very extreme degree where even if you're doing your best for the community, it doesn't matter. You're, you know what I mean? Yeah. You're still like a target for fees, fines, registration. You're always the bad person, even if you're not. And I'm like, whew, no. So I sold it to a home uh, owner occupant left. So that was my worst. Wow. Lost about 10K on the purchase, 12K on the first half of a four part 60K, you know, uh, was it 48,000 renovation? So about 22K total. And I say this because my husband is like my ex-husband. He's like, he was really salty about this, but I just went, wow, y'all are corrupt. I, I'm not. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I didn't know I was entering into a snake pit. You know, I didn't know. They literally used, like, didn't use my updated. They used an old one because technically they could. That they said it to crazy. my and the judge's face that when is I went to court about it. That, I just, wow. But it's, I'm not surprised, crazy. you know. I mean, mm -hmm. this corruption is everywhere. We, we know it goes down. I've never seen it like that. I was really in your face. Yeah. You know what I mean? That was real. That's why I sold the other property, took the profits, and reinvested it. Good for you. Uh, so that was the worst. And I want you to hear in my voice, I'm unbothered. It didn't take, like, I think I was depressed for a day because something like that will give anybody a blow. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> right? It gives you a little bit of a blow, but I think within a day or two, I was like, I was cool. I was like... If that's how it's going to roll, let me just get on out of here because I can't I can't play with people like that. Right. Well, thank God it, it didn't knock you out, you know? Mm -mm. No, just so, you know, hear from my voice. It's OK. It is. So Sometimes things can happen. It's OK. Yeah. It's a part of the journey. It is. So you talk a lot about affordable real estate investing. Mm -hmm. Explain what that is versus other types of real estate investing. A lot of the investing advice, as I mentioned earlier, really comes from an affluent sector. And they don't even realize how disconnected some of their advice is. So a lot of you go online, you're like, I want to invest in real estate. Who do I listen to? You listen to a guy who's usually, you know, privileged or affluent or women. And what happens is their advice is, you know, was what's comfortable for them. And what's comfortable for them is going in really nice neighborhoods or A-class neighborhoods and the best neighborhoods and the ones with the good school districts, right? And when you look at those numbers, those can be the most expensive neighborhoods and they don't even necessarily cash flow sometimes, right? So it is, their advice is for someone who has very, a lot of money, right? And they can just sit money there and not necessarily make a lot of cash flow. And for the people who are giving advice, the homes that were more affordable were usually in minority neighborhoods, you know, due to white flight, racism, steering, right? Mm -hmm. uh, all of those play into it. And that's why they are unaffordable. Now for the sector that was usually do it is generally white male and female and more affluent for them, like going to this A class neighborhood and paying a lot of money is the best bet than trying to go into a minority neighborhood that they don't understand 
and trying to solve. So a lot of the advice is like, don't you go to the cheap neighborhood. You're going to pay for it. So they really scare a lot of people off. So when I came up and I'm like, y'all need to chill. I grew up in these neighborhoods. It's not that serious. It basically, I mean, I, I was a little bit more articulate, but it came down to it's not that serious. This is what you do. This is how you analyze it. And so I really just focus on houses that cost thirty to $50,000. There are cars that cost more than that. There are cars that cost more than the houses I've purchased. Yeah, right. Absolutely. So it is affordable, even at like, even though it's a house that is affordable for quite a lot. There's a lot of people rolling around in forty five thousand dollar cars mm-hmm. or That's trucks. True. Trucks start at like thirty thousand. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yep. And I purchased three houses under thirty thousand. Right. Mm-hmm. Um. So it was just really so. It is affordable. It is a lower price compared to everyone else. It is minority neighborhoods, which I love because the majority of people who really resonate are minorities, right? Hispanic, black, Asian, but people who usually came from a modest background and had made to some certain level of success. And there's a second part about the impact. You know, I'm very clear, like, hey, I don't want anyone just going to these neighborhoods. I don't just go on any podcast. I don't go and evangelize everywhere because not everyone has the same heart that I that me and my tribe instinctively have for these neighborhoods. You grew up in a neighborhood like this, you care when you're an investor about trying to make a positive impact on the community. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, we also talk about, you know, how I don't necessarily raise my rents. All of my houses have appreciated in value, right. Due to low key gentrification, but we don't necessarily raise the rates on our families that are living as tenants in our place. The tenants who keep our place up, the tenants who clean, the tenants who pay on time, the tenants who have families. So we're really cognizant that we're going into the lowest income areas that we don't need to flip. And we can be a part of the affordable housing solution individually. So, yeah, I might have affected five families, but who knows? Maybe one of those kids who had a little bit more stability because I was the landlord and I cared and I didn't just raise the rents because I could legally. But I really thought about what I was doing and I was still profitable, but moderate and really understanding um, that thing. You know, like the what's the effect that you can have on a kid who can grow up in that place for 18 years? And maybe that was the stability they need to be able to do what they needed. So the other half of it that we are really strong about is making it affordable. If you raise rents, being very modest about it um, to necessarily cover your costs, but understanding we are going to the, some of the um, most, uh, like the only places some people who are in the working class who are hourly wage earners can live. And if we start just raising our prices just because we can, because we only care about ourselves, uh, because your bottom line, I mean, I like to say in the next 20 years, there's going to be a lot of changes going on. Which side of the equation do you want to be? Right. Mm-hmm. And so um, sometimes I get people who get really salty that I stand in that. They're like, I'm here to take care of my family. And I'm like, we don't need more exploitate, uh, more um, people exploiting people in these neighborhoods. You do have privilege because you have more money. Why don't you use that for the benefit of everyone, not just yourself? And a lot of people do get salty that I say that as an investor and I stand by it, but that's what we do. And we're going to make our changes at our level, at our pace individually. So if that means you have five houses, it's five families that you affected that you that didn't have to move out premature because of the stance you took. Hmm. Okay. So how long does it, would you say it takes to build a lucrative real estate portfolio? And what would you say is baseline lucrative yeah good question when i work with clients some people call me up and they want to work and i ask them all right what's your goal and i tell them my goal was two thousand dollars which i hit within three years right Mm -hmm. um so i'm saying you know what's your goal and some people it's like five and ten thousand but a lot of people are okay with two or three thousand right that's all and I, and I say that because, and I point it out because when I um, started doing the online teaching business full time, I was about $1,900 in cash flow a month. And I had the choice to keep working and find another job or do this full time. But that 1900 a month was enough for me to be comfortable going, I can do this and build this business and live off this. 
while, you know what I mean? Um, without needing to feel I need another nine to five, which takes up a lot of my time. So I always tell people like, look, I was making six figures at the time. I could have continued to make six figures as a salary because I was an, um, you know, an eight year IT technical consultant. But $1,900 in cash flow for my rental properties was enough to go, oh, well, I'm free to do this other thing I've always wanted to do that I think is really important, makes way more of an impact. And I, and I like doing way more than, you know, sitting at a computer all day, you know, doing database stuff. So sometimes it's two to 3,000. And I'm modest with things, but I find that a lot of people like that because it's something they can grasp more easily and how long does it take i'm um, using my strategy anywhere from two to five years it depends on how much capital you have i work with some people who've saved up fifty sixty thousand dollars um they have good credit and you know we can buy four or five properties that each get four hundred dollars in cash flow each five four hundred plus to be honest four to six hundred dollars in cash flow each we can hit that within you know a couple years um, other people, you might only have 10000 and it takes you like every ten year, every two years to save that up, right? Because you're a little tight and your income is a certain level. And so for you, it might take seven to 10 years to hit that cash flow goal. But I, I don't, honestly, I think both work because I think um, life needs to be more about 10 year increments than 30 year increments that the corporate environment has made it. Oh, in 30 years, no. I, I like a 10-year plan. So if it takes you 10 years or this person too, both I think are much more doable for you to get started on your purpose, mm -hmm. which is what you can do once you get that level of, of um, consistent passive income and cash flow. And when you say cash flow, you mean that you are paying the mortgage or uh -huh. whatever it is and all the bills that you need to pay and then you yep. have $400 in cash Plus. that's just... Yes, you know, ma'am. Profit. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Awesome. So, for instance, a number that's easier is like, um, so, uh, you know, a $50,000 house, the mortgage might be $400, and you get 900 in rents. Okay. Right? And mm -hmm. so, you know, you start subtracting for maintenance a little bit for, you know, 10 to 20%, however you feel comfortable for future expenses, and for you know the real Turk and you should be closer hitting that and sometimes you get even more I will it depends on what part of the country the Northeast um, when you find these areas have a higher rents than the Midwest which has higher rents than the South so depending on what markets we ultimately are looking at or where you live or where you want to invest we account we scale up and down for that okay that's great information so I was going to ask you, what are sub 30K properties? But I think those are the properties that you, you talk about saying that they have to be $30,000 yeah. mm -hmm. or below. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, and it depends on some places that were under 30000 they've all been purchased. So now it's under 50000 mm -hmm. But pretty much you can still find prices at any anywhere from fifteen dollars to $50,000. It just depends on the part of the country. So I'm really big on people sort of like the first question I ask is, where are you before I start? Just because you can do anything you want. But do you want to fly all the way across the, the world to get 400 in cash flow versus 350 an hour away? Right. So it, it really just depends on where you're at is where I start the conversation. And then we talk about how much you're either willing to travel or pay to get that extra aggressive cash flow or maybe you're in the south and the cash flow is not as high because the rents aren't as high but it's right next door to you so it's a conversation of what they want are willing to do to get that cash flow and if they're not willing to do maybe as much well then we sort of um, rearrange expectations to go well maybe we're on the three hundred dollars in cash flow scale all of them are good and all of them add up because you're not paying for this money out of, you know the rents are paying for this this is just what ends up in the bank afterwards, right? And it just gets you started on the portfolio. Okay. So how can people become a real estate investor without a traditional mortgage? Ah, so good question. <laughs> uh, this happened to me because the houses I purchased, I purchased through some, <laughs> I'm laughing because I had a foreclosure. So outside of the condo I purchased before I got the foreclosure, Outside of the condo, I purchased um, one, the $13,000 house I purchased by taking money from my 401k. The $25,000 I per um, when I purchased, I did it with a personal loan, a $30,000 personal loan from the credit union. 
the payments are higher. So I didn't really cash flow until year two. I had added it up. I was like, oh, okay, because the payment's higher because it's only over five years. Like personal loans aren't 30 years like mortgages. They're five years. Mm -hmm. And so the payment's higher, right? It's like a car payment for a $30,000 car. It could be $400, $500, $600 a month. Um, And, uh, yeah, so that is one way to get through it. You just have to understand that your cash flow is going to be delayed a bit. But on the other hand, you will completely own it within four to five years, right? Because it is an accelerated payoff schedule. And I actually really appreciate that because then you just really just get most of the rent deposited into your account. Um, the other ways I paid for it, the one that I had purchased in Baltimore that they took through their vacancy to value program or whatever you call their corruption at that time. <laughs> that one was, uh, I actually had taken my car and it had equity cause I, I have a Honda and Hondas really hold their value. So I had paid it off and then like, it still is worth 10,000. So I took it to the, um, bank and said, Hey, can I refinance the equity in my, my car? It's worth 10,000. They looked at the native value, which is the national automotive dealership association values. Uh, they don't do a KBB. Usually they do the NADA. They're like, yeah, your car is still worth 10K. So we can offer you, a, you know, an automotive auto loan at 3%. And I got 10K and that's how I bought the one property in uh, Baltimore. So uh, non, when you have a foreclosure, but you're still paying on time and your credit score is decent. And of course, there's things that I teach on how to handle it, like refinancing and how to re- and when to refinance. But you can do it. And that's everything about the strategy came because I could only get what was in my 401k. I can only do what I can get a personal loan for. And I can only do what I could like refinance something that had equity. So that's where it all really came out of. Um, And I was just like, I'll just wait seven years, but I'll do it with these low key other methods to get there while I'm waiting the seven years. Because I didn't want to wait seven years and then invest. So I was like, I can do it with these other methods that I put away in different pockets um, to do it. Girl, you are creative. I like it. (laughs) (laughs) It's a gift. It's from God. Yes, it is a gift. It just comes right through. So what do people have to be prepared for when venturing into real estate investments? Okay. Well, it just depends. Um, It depends if you do it on your own or if you do it with help, Right. Um, so we're talking about, you just want to do it on your own. You need to be prepared to have a learning curve. What seems obvious isn't dealing with contractors and dealing with people is a learning process on how they roll. Like for instance, one little thing they'll find is that, you know, when you go to like McDonald's, like the customer's always right. You know, let me complain to the manager. But then when you get to be like in contractors, It's like some dude in a truck. It ain't, it's not corporate, right? So you really have to learn that, like, you can't just talk to contractors anyway. You can't just let them get over on you. But, like, you got to understand there's nothing behind this one dude. So it's really a person-to-person business. And some people have all these corporate rules. And they're like, that just doesn't matter with the mom and pop. A mom and pop, they may or may not call you back because they're trying to do everything themselves. They may not manage money well. And how do you handle that, right? And how do you talk to them? What if they're not as, um, sometimes they're really professional, sometimes they're not, do you keep them? So there's this learning curve about the human interaction and sizing someone up uh, that you need to learn at all levels. Like for instance, realtors. You think realtors really are excited about looking at $20,000 houses where their commission $600 when they're used to selling $200,000 houses and getting $6,000, right? Mm Mm-hmm. So you don't think about that, right? And so if you're doing this strategy, it's going to be a learning curve on how to talk to people because you really got to make it an incentive in economical ways to get them to want to work with you. You got to say certain things and you get a lot of people who just don't pick up your phone call again. They're nice on the phone because no one wants to ever tell you no. They don't do it or no, I don't go to... Some people just don't want to say, like, I'm not going to those neighborhoods. Right. So they'll say something nice and you call them back and they don't pick up the phone. So you have to learn like little things like that on how to manage the people relationship at this level. And I think sometimes that's what gets people is the human relationships. So um, if you have a really high, uh, what is it? Emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. 
you handle all that with ease, but you know, there's only a small number of people who have high emotional intelligence. <laughs> the rest of us are like cavemen, <laughs> like trying to bang our way out. You know what I mean? I, I put myself. I'm I'm more evolved now, but definitely I was more in the like just punching through punching walls. You know trying to figure this thing out. So that could be something that is a little bit of an uphill battle. Um, and I just say that's if you do it alone. If you know someone who's done it before and they're walking you through the process and you can just go, hey, I saw this crack. Should I be worried? They're like, oh, no. You want to know why it only goes in two, inch, two inches deep? It doesn't go all the way down into the foundation. This is just a surface level crack. When you're working with someone um, like myself or other mentors that you have who know the business, it's not going to be hard because you get all your questions answered. Hey, the property manager did this. Is that normal? Yep. And this is how you handle it, right? So um, it just depends if you're doing it by yourself. You just have a steep, you know, a learning curve um, versus if you go um, with someone. And and I'm not doing that just to like, like I'm, I'm a big fan of coaching, but it's like the reality is it's easy when you can ask someone a question who's experienced, right? Absolutely. Or apprentice. Yes, I agree. So I want to play a little game. I It's called the Oh Hell No Game. <laughs> yeah. And you answered some of these questions just in your um, just giving answers, but I still want to play. So um, I'm going to ask you a question or I'm just going to say a statement and you tell me if this is an Oh Hell No or it's an Oh Hell Yes. I like it. So, okay. Buy a two family home and rent out the other side as an investment property is that an oh hell no or an oh hell yes oh hell yes please okay i want everyone to buy their first five primary residences that they'll live in like it's an investment i want it to be less than what you can pay i want it to be in an undervalued neighborhood that you see can has potential and I want you to do that for the first five houses because that's how you get the money for your dream house. That's how you get, well, I bought it for 100000 100, but then we sold it for two hundred mm-hmm. after four years. You know, that's what I want for people because that's been what I've been doing because I always buy undervalued and it really works. So, um, yes. Oh, hell yes. Even with a duplex. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Use equity out of your current home to purchase an investment property. Oh, hell no. Oh, hell yes. Oh, hell yes. But make sure you know what you're doing or you're with someone who does. Okay. Mm -hmm. Use money from my 401k to start investing in real estate. Oh, hell no. Oh, hell yes. Oh, hell yes. But be moderate, right? So maybe for the first property, take 10 or 15,000 out and then see how it feels. If you're comfortable with your results, your cash flowing, your house and investments are stable, then reassess if you'd like to take more. I'm not saying demolish it and take it all out and put it on red, right? So yes, moderately. Okay. Start an investment group with the goal of investing in real estate. Oh, hell no. Oh, hell yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's fine. Doing multiple investments at the same time. Oh, hell yes. Oh, hell no. Don't do it. You'll be stuck. You'll need more money for this one, and you'll need money for that one. And people are looking at you like you need to pay me, or I'm losing money on this if I don't get it done one at a time. Invest- Unless it's a package deal. Okay. Investing in property in other states. Um, oh hell no. Oh hell yes. Oh hell yes. Okay. When you live in New York and DC, you can't afford properties. All I, ninety percent of the people I work with live in California, D.C., Texas, Atlanta, and we invest long distance, and I and I help them through the process. Wow. Mhm. And is this a get rich quick scheme or? Hmm. Uh, oh hell no, 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 no! It is gonna get you richer faster than other methods because it's more obtainable and more affordable. Mhm. But it's not. It's not a scheme. It is straightforward. And it is a very effective. Okay, that's a fair answer. And the only reason I ask that is because a lot of times people think when it comes to real estate, you know, mm-hmm. that's usually that's the motivating factor is like, oh, they saw somebody who owns all this property and they, you know, yeah. have this money yeah. in the property, but they don't realize all of the work and time and effort that goes into it. And they think, oh, I'm going to do that and have yeah. that. But like you said, it has to really fit for you, you know? Yeah, 
Yes. Yeah. So. And I mean, those are the people who are like, real estate investing is easy. I've never said that. Like, those are the people, you know what I mean? That I would be wary mm-hmm. of. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Those are the schemes because I have never, not once in nine years, have ever said that. I said, we can do it. I said, it can be done. But I never was like, hmm, don't worry. It's easy. <laughs> Just do it. Never. I wouldn't even occur to me to say that. So you wrote a book called Investing in Real, Real Properties for Beginners. Rental. Investing in rental properties for beginners. Investing. What What did I say? Real. <laughs> Sorry. Investing. Okay. In, girl, I'm a mess. So you wrote a book called Investing in Rental Properties for Beginners. Yes. What made you want to write that book? And what do you want people to take from that book? All right. Um, Lisa's the biggest fan of passive income. That's why we started this nine years ago. So I was listening uh, last January. I was listening to an affirmation. It's by your creators on YouTube. He makes excellent affirmations. And it was about passive income. I listen to this one hour listen every day for like 21 days. And I even said it out loud because you start memorizing some of the words. And I woke up on day 21, which was like February 28th, the day after my birthday. And I went, I'm writing a freaking book. So you're like, why did I write it? It was in my head, but it wasn't until I did those affirmations for 21 days that I was like, no, we're writing a book. And I started to look into all my contacts who I knew were book writers um, or who were editors or whatnot. And um, what was the second part of the question? But that was the why I bought it. It was just something in me after doing those passive income affirmations that came forward. And what do you want people to take from the book? Oh, yeah. I want you to take from it that there is a way to do this. It does not have to be scary. It can be very straightforward. And you can piece by piece put it all together and go from not having it to wanting to do it to knowing you can do it and getting started. That's what I want for you to clearly see all the steps laid out one by one about if you have to invest long distance, how do you talk to real estate agents? How do you find these markets? How do you analyze a property? I wanted you to see it all laid out. Take the fear out that there is a way to do this and that you can know what each step is in the system. And sometimes you just need that full, well-rounded look of things to be comfortable going forward. Okay. So what does success look like to you? Having enough passive income to work on your purpose. I talk to people, when you get the money, say you get the two, 3000 in cash flow, what, what's next? Some people are like, I don't know. But 90% are like, oh, I had one guy say, I want to go back to Pakistan and there's kids with like who don't have food or and they don't eat and they don't have shoes. I want to go help. Someone else was like, I want to go to convicts in prison and I ran a successful business. I want to teach them how to run successful businesses. Another couple told me, you know what? We like to sing and praise and worship and we'd like to go around the country and lift people up and just sing and give praise to those who might need it at the right time. Another woman said, I was a single mother and for teenage, teenage mothers and there's resources out there and I want to go help them know that you think you can't do it, but you can. Let me show you how. Another woman said, I was a single mother that transitioned from stay at home to the workforce. I want to teach other single mothers how to do that even with kids. And so and I show you these examples to go, if we have enough passive income in our life to feel comfortable, which doesn't have to be that much, we are then able to go out and make the impact that we are here to make. Mm. We don't need governments. If we can get out of the nine to five, you know, slaving away at the nine to five to really feel empowered to start on that thing we always inside knew that we were here to do, we wouldn't need help from anyone except ourselves because we would be doing the things that are empowering everyone to ascend to that higher state of being. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. I love that. You know I live for that. Come on, Lisa. Girl, I love asking the question, and I love when I get the answers because it makes me feel good. It's electrifying. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you sacrifice to do what you're doing? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, can you? Can I ask you 
to doing what the real estate investing being self-employed and teaching real estate investing yes is- because you put a lot of time into teaching others yeah um you also run a business you're an entrepreneur as yes. you know that's a 24 okay. hours a job right 24 hours a day you know it actually wasn't sacrifice so um we had moved to a town in central virginia mm-hmm. called charlottesville i didn't know anyone and i made that place is very um, segregated, very class stratified. So I actually did. I was used to having millions of friends, and I went there, and I couldn't make any because it was like if you don't know someone from a long time ago, or we're not in the clique, like you're not in, right? And they mm-hmm. are strict down there. So actually, there wasn't even sacrifice there because when I left the job and I was just going to go focus on this full time. Um, because I wasn't, didn't have as active a social life as I usually have, which is going out multiple times a week, I actually spent all that time at, like on my business and the creation process and going, oh, well, let me do this and oh, let me offer this. And uh, so I have to say because, um, you know, I always say it's divine. Like I did not like my time there, but I can appreciate that my house like doubled in value. I can appreciate that. Um, because I didn't have an active social life, I poured for four years all of that time and attention in my business. So I, 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 I would almost say I didn't sacrifice too much. Maybe my anxiety levels at times, mm-hmm. right? Because you know you go on this roller coaster and it's up and down. You're not always guaranteed any consistency. At least back then. Now with the passive income and my investments in the book. There is a level of consistency. It's not super high, but it's enough for me. Because remember, I'm okay with 2000 a month. Right. I don't need what you need. Right. right? I can be cool with so much uh, less than what other people say they want. Um, so I would say sometimes I just sacrifice things, a little anxiety and always just like that pit in your stomach. Like, oh, oh nothing's coming in. I'm not getting clients. What do I do? Um, but not too many sacrifices outside of that. Because divine timing really just worked out. That's good. I like that. Mm -hmm. So do you feel like you are doing your purpose work? Mm -hmm. Yes, I am. Walk. I I actually found out through the last three years because of because actually I got into the passive income at the point it's at. I've been able to delve more deeply and spend more time on my spirituality and the meditation, what that yields and the insights it yields and working with my spiritual healers and channelers and my angelic channelers and energy workers and um, I found and through that journeying visiting the Akashic Records and finding out what my purpose was and the financial education that I'm doing mostly for the black community was part of my purpose so I was walking in the light which is probably why the business has always been sustained because I was supposed to be doing it you know you mean any business you want but a soul aligned business that's making impact in people's life and that's the one that really is supported by not just what you're physically doing, but like literally by this, like the spiritual world is like going, yes, yes, yes. This is the next step in everyone's evolution. Um, and so I was walking my purpose work and now I also do healings. I'm an energy healer. I found out that I can heal. So, um, the house that I just moved into, I'm going to start doing weekly healings where I literally lay hands and heal and um, I've already been doing it for a couple of people, people with back pain who are like, this feels great. And they're coming back and we're getting this consistency. So now I'm also walking in that second part of my purpose, uh, which is new, but it's growing in the way that um, I've been led and told that it will because it's my, my, my next calling. Wow. Look at you. Yeah, I'm really spiritual. I mean, but good. I mean, that's what passive income gave me. It gave me that breathing room to like delve deep and find out what I was here for. Right. I love that. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. So, um, this is the Oh Hell No podcast, girl. So you have to share an Oh Hell No moment with us. Um, I feel like that issue in Maryland would have been an Oh Hell No moment, but Ooh. I'm sure. Took me out for a little bit, girl. Yes, but I'm sure you have had more (laughs) because we all have them. Um, But, you know, they're a part of our journey and they just help us to get more grounded and, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was learning lessons. I learned that, you know, don't be, I learned don't be naive and keep an eye out. Yeah. 
Do you know what I mean? Keep an eye out. Not that's, everyone's on the same side as you. Yeah, that's a definite mm-hmm. lesson from that. Oh, hell no. Even within it. the government. Right. Mm-hmm. They're not always there to help. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so eyes wide open now. Right. Okay, I'll take that as an oh hell no moment. So it was such a pleasure having you on the podcast. You shared a lot of great information with us today. I'm sure this will help a lot of people. You got me thinking. And I'm really not into investment property because I'm just like, oh my God, I don't want to have to deal with like people not doing this or doing that or, you know, being responsible for this, that, and the third. But you've really given me a different perspective Mm -hmm. and you know i might have to look into it baby steps right so thank you for that i appreciate it please tell everyone where they can learn more about your company where they can purchase your book how they can reach you if they want to um you know sign up with you and and get started in investing in real estate Oh, good, good. You can go to my webpage. We'll get you to everything. It's affordablerealestateinvestments.com. Um, you can just Google Lisa Phillips Affordable Real Estate. I'll come right up. So it's affordable real, www.affordablerealestateinvestments.com. On there, you can look at free resources, um, the training center. You can also get access to our Facebook group. There are 8,000 mostly black investors in there. We're killing it. Join it just because people, when you join, you go from, I think I can to I will. Like you can't because the energy in there, which I am very protective of the energy of who I let in and not everyone's welcome to be quite honest. Um, (laughs) They're not, you know, I'm a lot more discerning. Um, And uh, it's people, they are there. They are like me. It's my tribe. They're here because they're like, I came from that. I'm here now, and I'm going to help as many people as I can. So it's like the most supportive community. They're here for each other. They understand no one has any rose-colored lenses. They're very real about where we come from, who we are, the neighborhoods we deal with. They're very real and a beautiful, I'm going to get things done type of way, right? So we don't really dwell on problems in that group. We always dwell on solutions. Yeah. And there's that's a different creative spark. So you'd also like to join the Facebook group. And on my website, you can also see a free copy of my book. You just uh, paperback if you'd like. You can just pay um, shipping and handling. Uh, also, you just click on the link that says free book if you'd like to look into that and partake or get it off of Amazon. But affordablerealestateinvestments.com, thank you so much. And I hope you truly, truly enjoy this and got some value out of this conversation. And yeah. thank you for having such a great podcast. I really love it. Oh, you're so sweet. I really love this podcast because I'm telling you, you like educated me right now. 